why is classical music dying? To find out, I read some seriously debated opinions, revisited some of my own experiences in the classical music industry, and accidentally stumbled on a formula that I kind of think might fix it? Let's get into this. So if you ask pretty much anyone what they think about classical music, they'll probably say it's boring or outdated or pretentious or long or stuffy or snobby, but mostly they'll say it's dying. And you can all but hear the good riddance at the end of their sentence. And the institutions that sell classical music agree, like they know they're dying. Except they'll say, well, audiences are uneducated. People can't appreciate art anymore. Popular music is pedantic and draining the masses of their ability to analyze anything critically. Classical music isn't dying so much as it's being murdered by stupid people. But I don't want opinions. I actually want to know why. Like, is there anything that we can do about it? And I guess more importantly, do we even want to? If we look at things like the Mona Lisa, Mega Churches, John Williams, The Nutcracker, Romeo and Juliet, these are all things that have found a way to be culturally relevant despite having relations to industries that are rapidly dying. Like, I don't believe that any of you who are watching this actually think that classical music is boring, but I totally get that if you have to sit in a theater and listen to it for three hours without being allowed to talk or move or drink, that might make you question why you like it. And sure, maybe there's some some kind of education that can help audiences appreciate the traditions of classical music a little bit more, like getting to audiences at a younger age. But what it really comes down to is just relevance. Classical music needs its audiences way more than its audiences need it. So if it wants to survive this transition from boomers to centennials and millennials, it needs to find a way to convince the new audience that it's still culturally relevant, assuming it wants to. Starting with distribution. What I mean by this is how we consume stuff here in these lovely 2020s. We are an on-demand society, and for better or worse, all non-dying music caters to that expectation. So classical music has to be available somewhere that we can stream it, or we ain't gonna listen to it. I wish it were different, but some classical albums are available to stream. And let's talk about those. Have you ever noticed how classical albums sound different? Kind of muddy, not crisp, the volume is constantly changing, the sound isn't equalized. It almost sounds like it was recorded a long time ago, even if it just came out. Well, that's because classical music is literally recorded differently. Like there are whole production companies based around that very specific classical music sound. And what they're trying to replicate is this. The sound of the room. Basically what you hear in your headphones is as close as you can get to the sound you'd have if it were live. It sucks. Now, in defense of classical music, the entire genre is built on the tradition of live performance. I mean, if you think about it, like 80% of it was written before 1900, so, you know, no electricity. It makes sense that composers wrote for the place that audiences would be listening in. Except audiences aren't in theaters anymore, at least not at first. And so we have different expectations. We want stereo sound in our ears that's recorded in soundproof studios with individual mics on each instrument recorded on separate tracks across multiple takes, and then Frankenstein together by sound engineers and producers. Don't nobody want to be hearing a reproduction of an acoustic in their head Phones. And we haven't even talked about how classical musicians film themselves. The 720 pixel ratio, the camera microphones, like the weird angles of a person just like standing on a stage in a dress like they're going to high tea with King. Like, I'm not even sure that I would want to watch Beyonce do that. Who is this actually entertaining? But let's say, for the sake of argument, we get all this right. Let's say that we produce something that people actually want to consume. There's still a problem with what's being recorded. Let's talk about programming. See, in every other genre today, we expect artists to release original music. And yet, album after album of classical music released today is recordings of 200-year-old songs played in the same way that they would have been 200 years ago. This is what the classical world refers to as programming, essentially what music you're gonna be playing for audiences and it's never original. And let's really make this point. Let's just imagine that Bruno Mars decides to drop an album of Elvis covers. Literally, that's it. Like the same backing tracks, the same words, the same dance moves, the same costumes, nothing is different except 
It's just Bruno Mars. And then Ed Sheeran does the same thing. And then Justin Bieber. And then Harry Styles. And then John Legend. And then Elton John. And on and on and on and on until the world is just swimming in Elvis covers and dudes wearing white sequin suits. Fun. Maybe a little weird at first, but we probably wouldn't be talking about Bruno anymore after like, I don't know, two weeks. But then imagine Bruno retaliating to this lack of relevance anymore by telling you it's your fault that his music isn't popular anymore because you're not willing to understand what makes him more special as an Elvis impersonator than literally everyone else. And God forbid you didn't like Elvis to begin with, that's just uneducated. Do we see how ridiculous this is? Like, how arrogant? This is what classical music is doing today. Hundreds of thousands of people playing. same old ways and demanding relevance through these accusations that we have failures in our educational system and not the industry itself. But it wasn't always this way. See, these days when we think about classical music, we tend to think about the instruments and the performers. But back then, it was all about the composers. Orchestras used to perform new works pretty much all the time. Mozart was original, Beethoven was original, so was Mahler, so was Debussy. Because composers in history were no different from pop artists today. They constantly put out original stuff, they took it on tour, and they made deals with people who had more power than them to make them even more famous. So why did that stop? When did orchestras stop performing original stuff and start demanding that audiences only listen to covers of Elvis songs? the Mozart songs. To answer that, we need to take a quick detour to the 20th century. I'm not gonna go into everything about how music changed across the 1900s, especially as traveling and recording became things that were more accessible. There are lots of people who've already covered the birth of jazz and rock and roll and like all the other genres that we know today, and I've put some of their videos in the description below. But suffice it to say that a hundred years later, our ears just aren't used to acoustic instruments anymore. It's part of the growth and experimentation that humans have always had with music, and electronic music is just where we are today. But because acoustic instruments haven't been in vogue for a minute, there's not a whole heck of a lot that's being written for the instruments you'll find in orchestras and opera houses today. And when new stuff's not being written, you write your own. <laughs> no, that's terrifying. You do covers, which it turns out after a few hundred years aren't super relevant anymore. Classical musicians can release as many new albums of super old songs with really weird recording techniques as they want. No one cares. And without an audience, there's no money. This is maybe the biggest secret the classical music industry has been trying to keep from people. Everyone's poor. Opera houses, symphonies, orchestras, ballets, they may look like they're the height of like luxury and sophistication, but don't let that gold leaf fool you. They are barely holding on. And to understand this, here's how the music industry makes its money today. Once an artist drops an album, according to Business Insider, they'll make about 4% of their income on streaming platforms like Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, those kinds of things. Then 5% comes from brand deals like fashion or makeup brands, sports partnerships. Then another roughly 10% comes from licensing their music to movies, advertisements, TV shows, video games. But then this whole huge chunk of about 80% left is made on tour. And that's ticket sales, merchandise, CDs, interviews, backstage passes, all the stuff that goes into seeing our favorite artists live. Now let's put classical music on the same model. Now already they've kind of shot themselves in the foot by not releasing something new. Unless you're a musician yourself, you're probably gonna choose the classical music you do listen to because of the song, not the people playing it. You're gonna go see the Nutcracker because it's the Nutcracker. Who cares who's playing it? No way is that making anyone any kind of money. Okay, so then what about branding? Well, when's the last time you saw a classical musician on the back of a box of Cheerios? Or okay, even something that might even make more sense, like a perfume company. It doesn't happen. Do we know why? No, but it doesn't happen. So it's not making anyone any money. Now licensing could be a thing, but not to beat a dead horse here, it's not original. So the only thing they own is the actual performance. And then once you split that fee across every musician in the orchestra, the conductor, the rehearsal fees, the rehearsal space, the recording space, the recording engineers, yeah, 
that's not making anyone any money either. But thankfully, we're still left with 80% of the puzzle here, which they also don't do. That's kind of a thing. You have to go to them. But even if you do go, most aren't really selling merch the way modern music does, so that leaves ticket sales. How do you think that's working for them? I mean, when you look at it like this, it's kind of amazing that there's any kind of classical music to go see at all. Like, how is it still alive? Oh yeah. Look, classical music has messed up a lot, but if there's one thing they did really well, it was elitist marketing. Classical music lovers are fancy. They're sophisticated, they're educated and interesting and probably fabulously wealthy and they can discuss poetry and literature, painting, sculpting, ballet, all in Greek and Latin. And this comes directly from the tradition of patronage that's been around for ages in the classical music industry. Even back in the 1700s, behind every artist was someone with a lot of money controlling their decisions. And then when classical music started branching into other genres, so did the ownership. So it's no different today. Except back then, instead of record companies owning decisions, it was literal royalty. But then when classical music with its like violins and composers got left in the dust in the early 1900s, the wealthy patrons supporting it got left with it. But rather than allow themselves to disappear completely into history books, instead they used their money to turn classical music into a playground for the wealthy. So much so that a hundred years later, we still think of classical music as only being for the upper echelons of society. Because they own it! They are the only ones keeping the classical music industry today alive. So they call the shots. And so they've turned classical music into this exclusivity image that supports the wealth and status that they have worked so hard to acquire. And by worked hard, I mean inherited. And if you're a classical musician and you're given the choice to either die or stay alive, you're probably gonna do what you have to to stay alive, even if it means basically being a slave to modern day aristocrats. So how does classical music save itself? Well, first it needs to get away from the ownership model that it's operated under for literal centuries. Classical music will never be able to pull itself out of the clutches of its patrons unless it can find a way to replicate the model that works for literally every other genre and that used to work for it. I think the first step, what we've been building to for this whole video, is to make something new. And there are two ways to do this. Either writing new music or innovating old stuff. Writing new music in the style of classical music is a totally valid option. And there are so many people who've been successful with that. Josh Groban, Lindsey Sterling, Charlotte Church, Yo-Yo Ma, insert your classical crossover artist here. New music can work, but it's also not the only way to be new. Playing film scores live while audiences watch the movie is a great innovation that's been really successful. Or making YouTube reactions videos or turning classical music into a game works. Incorporating classical pieces into modern covers works. Creating comedy around it works. All of these things are new takes on something old and that's where it has to start. It's the act that's gonna sell first, then the music. But becoming relevant is kind of only the beginning. Classical music is gonna have to make the money that it needs to survive that relevance, which is a fabulous sentence, but what does it mean? Well, look, relevance is gonna make classical music more popular, and popularity is the literal opposite of elitism. And once those hoity-toity patrons start having to sit next to 15-year-old fangirls, they're gonna start pulling their money because, well, Never really was about the music, was it? But as we know, ticket sales are only a tiny portion of what makes money these days. And with their sponsors probably walking out the doors, classical musicians and institutions who've become relevant are going to have to adapt to the way that money is made in the 21st century. Which brings us to step two, marketing and proximity. Under the marketing umbrella, we have albums, interviews, brand deals, videos, social media, all that stuff that's gonna support the proximity factor getting to audiences. If relevant classical musicians are going to survive, they can't keep expecting the audience to come to them. But now you may be thinking to yourself, well, hold on, there are definitely people who have figured out how to make this work. And to that, I say, you're absolutely right. And that's exactly the reason that it's taking classical music so long to die. Film composers are a great example of classical musicians figuring out how to stay relevant and make money. Classical crossover groups that tour shows like Celtic Woman or Phantom of the Opera or Anuna, or even more recently, you know those like um, candlelight concerts where you can go and see a recital by candlelight? How cool is that? And like culturally relevant because aesthetics, 
And yeah, they, I presume they make money. The point is, classical music will survive so long as there are a small handful of people who are doing all the heavy lifting to keep everyone else out of the grave. But I do kind of hope that classical musicians are interested in doing a little bit more than just scraping by on the work of a small minority like we have been for the last century. Which brings us to a formula. So as a classical musician with a vested interest in figuring this out, here's what I would do. First, I would figure out if 200-year-old music is gonna be my thing. If so, I'm gonna wrap a gimmick around it to make it relevant. But if not, I'll make something new and then let that newness be my relevance. And then once I had my relevance, I would move my audience away from those like same old patrons who'll tell you that relevance removes legitimacy. It doesn't, but it might remove your poverty and take it to people who actually like what I do. And then rinse and repeat, create, share, listen, create, share, listen, until my audience confirms my relevance with the almighty end goal, money. Oh, yeah, community, Com community stop stuff from dying. Also money. Ultimately, I don't think the genre is the problem. I think people like classical music itself, but the industry that we've built around classical music is dying. Thankfully, there are people who have done this before and we have figured out what to do, maybe? So in the end, the question isn't actually why is classical music dying? The question is, do we care enough to fix it? If you're interested in any of the articles that I referenced about the decline of classical music across generations, I have linked them all in the description below. And if you're interested in other oddities about classical music, then you can check out this video here that I made a little bit earlier this year about opera singers and vibrato. Uh, otherwise, that's it from me today. I hope you enjoyed this video, and yeah, I'll see you next time on Scores Unstitched. Bye!